All right, and welcome to the Vonu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. So today, guys, today, um, in this uh, health liberation, self liberation uh, episode, um, I've got a uh, yeah very very special guest for you. Um, I've got uh, Sophia Smallstorm. Uh, she's from Sophia Smallstorm. Dot com. Uh, she is a researcher. I uh, came across, I guess it would have been, uh, oh, maybe four or five months ago uh, as, a, as a result of uh, COVID-19. I heard a lot of, a lot of discussions with her. Uh, one of note that I will make sure to link in the show notes uh, is her discussion with uh, Dr. Andrew Kaufman, uh, Kaufman who I, uh, I really, really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed that discussion. But uh, Sophia, like I said, she's a researcher, uh, covers a, a lot of subjects. Um, but uh, as, as far as uh, recently what I've been digging into of hers is uh, exosomes, endosomes. Uh, those have uh, come up uh, in regards to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, scamdemic. Uh, she's uh, done a lot of research on the disease process, uh, something we've been talking about on this podcast, trying to get to the to the root cro- root cause of chronic disease, uh, so we can solve it. Uh, and she's uh, also well known, uh, pretty well known for her work uh, with uh, uh, her her knowledge on uh, EMF and electricity and the the problems that they cause uh, in the human body, uh, as well as some solutions uh, like uh, some elect- elect- electrotherapy sort of stuff, um, grounding. Uh, so we're going to talk, uh, we're going to get into some problems uh, certainly, uh, but uh, definitely getting into, into some solutions uh, as well. So, Sophia, welcome to the Vani Podcast. It's uh, great to have you here. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm fine, Shane. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for following um, some things that I've done over the last few months, as you told me you were. That's very kind of you, and also to introduce me to new people. Sure, sure. Yeah, and uh, I, I mean, it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, like I said, I've, I've been I've been digging into a lot of your stuff, and uh, I guess my, my route for uh, my my route for research is uh, basically if I hear someone new on a podcast I like, uh, I will go and track down everything that they've done that I can find on the internet, and uh, I will try to uh, try to listen to it. I don't think I've gotten through everything of yours yet. I think there's still some some things from 2016 and 2017 that I haven't gotten to yet, but most of the stuff from from this year um, has uh, yeah has been uh, very very illuminating for me, and I, I certainly appreciate uh, the efforts you put forth uh, you know so far uh, in your work. So. Um, I guess to, to, to begin, um, could you, uh, you know, briefly introduce, introduce, introduce yourself to my audience, if I can talk, um, you know, uh, tell them a bit about uh, your work and uh, how you got to uh, here to uh, today. Well, Shane, I'm just a curious person, and I like to know what people do and think and how the body works and just how the world works, and I try to follow it to explain to myself and answer my own questions. And I guess this became popular when I started to go into all different directions with my newsletter. Somebody many years ago who had a newsletter, a printed newsletter that she sent out every month, wanted me to do one and I was terrified. I didn't know what what am I gonna write about every month. And then I decided to dive in and get my feet wet. And I think the first newsletter I wrote was about the Dave McGowan material that was online before he created the book Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon about Laurel Canyon. Mm. And I was fascinated by these articles he had posted about the music industry. And I knew other things as well. And I cobbled it all together. And that was my first newsletter. So the newsletter, that was back in 2010. And what year are we now? 2020. And I've been doing this pretty much every month. Sometimes I do a double issue, but I do serve a newsletter or content per each month of each year. And it's been going on for 10 years now. So I'm a little mm-hmm. shocked. But what that's done for me, Shane, is it has enabled me to record and um, in a way systematize the things that I've looked into And when people ask me questions or they want to do a radio show, I say, oh, yeah, I wrote a newsletter about that. And I just pull out the newsletter and there's all my reference. So it's been great for me to organize myself and what I've learned in terms of all the different directions I've gone. And as you know, electromagnetism has been something that it it rules our world now. Electricity. Mm -hmm. We live in an electrified world. And that has changed so much about our biology. 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, that is a, a perfect segue into uh, uh, how I want to really start this discussion. Uh, and like I like I told you in, in pre-show, I kind of want the, the theme to be the bioelectric body, um, as, as we were kind of alluding to already. But uh, when we first talked last week, uh, one thing that came up was uh, that you expect to see more degenerative conditions from EMF exposure. Uh, that's certainly not something within the purview of most. Most don't, well, I guess most people don't think, so obviously like they don't probably don't think about that too much either. Um, but uh, if we can start with a broad question, I guess uh, just uh, when when you look at uh, EMF and uh, I don't know the toxic onslaught, just the world in general, you know what what is uh, what is the view of the world look like from the eyes of Sophia Smallstorm uh, from your research and experience? Well, I'm going to not answer that question and instead take us back to 1746 and the Leyden jar. Have you ever heard of this, the Leyden jar and the, the Leyden experiment? Jar. I don't think so. All right, so the Leyden jar was a physics professor's effort to put and to store electricity in a bottle okay so today this is these things are known as capacitors or condensers but back then in the 1700s people came up with this experiment where they had a glass flask filled with water and a nail in the cork all right and then you would rub this glass with your hands and you would build up a static charge in it. And then if you touch the nail, you'd get this terrible shock, sometimes bad enough to throw you across the room. This was a demonstration of voltage, and it was basically static electricity. But I'll tell you, the general public was absolutely enthralled by the Leyden experiment, and they would line up by the thousands in the 1700s to experience these electric shocks, okay? And they would form a big circle, maybe hundreds of people all holding hands. And somebody would rub the jar, get the shock, and everybody holding hands, that shock would pass through everybody. And everybody would be simultaneously in this electromagnetic um, state of euphoria. They thought they mm. had just experienced something absolutely fantastic. And then the public started to grumble because this was so popular, this Leyden jar public experiment, that they didn't want to wait in line for it to feel the shock. So they, there was a demand for a portable Leyden jar that you could use at home and enjoy at your leisure. So this is how crazy people were about electricity. Electromania, it was called. Even the researchers at the time said this shock was so strong that electricity should not be inflicted on the living. And we have electromania going on today. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting start. So um, I guess uh, uh, on that note, we'll say uh, so. Electromania. Um, when uh, when I look at the world 2020, uh, you know, that it seems uh, seems pretty crazy. So I I, I would uh, uh, obviously there's a lot of factors. Uh, you know, the the indoctrination, uh, the, uh, the the mind control propagated by the media and all, and all that. Um, but uh, you would you would uh, do, you, do you attribute some of that uh, that mania um, to maybe that anxiety and kind of this that, that panic uh, panic state to EMFs, the 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 rise and the increase in electricity, uh, I guess electric exposure. We have way too much electric exposure. And the thing is, technology strives to keep that just under the level that it will do noticeable damage, cook your cells, heat your cells. So they call this non-lethal electricity. And nobody has really studied it properly because it is, in fact, affecting us all over the world. So the book that I want to draw your listeners' attention to that will explain this, it's a very long book, but it's very brilliantly written. It's The Invisible Rainbow by Arthur Furstenberg. And um, the material in that book is quite, quite fascinating. Electricity, we couldn't imagine lives without electricity today. I mean, when we have these power downs as they're doing, the rolling blackouts that they're trying to get us all used to, people are without electricity for even a few hours. It, they can't get out of their garage. They, can't, they don't know how to do the manual yank on that string on their garage opener. They don't know how to, they can't make a cup of tea. They can't take a hot shower. I mean, there's so much you can't do unless you have electricity. And so it pretty much immobilizes everybody. But what people don't understand is that it's affecting you neurologically because we do 
have bodies that are full of crystalline materials, all of which store and transmit electrical um, energies, frequencies, voltages. There, this is everywhere in our body. We run on bioelectricity. It is the stuff of life. So to be surrounded by electricity as we are, and then to have it going on in our body, obviously the the potency of the electricity around us in our lives is a lot greater than the very minimal, subtle bioelectricity we're living on and from. So people aren't aware that the electric um, environment they're in is adversely affecting their own electricity. And one sign of this, I would submit, is the level of stress we're under. The neurology has changed. We, are, we can't go into parasympathetic nervous system mode uh, as much as we need to. When you go to sleep at night, you're supposed to be in parasympathetic mode, which is rest, digest, and sleep. But you're in sympathetic mode because you've got a cell phone next to you as an alarm clock. You've got a Wi-Fi router pulsing under your desk. You've got a smart meter on the side of your house that pulses thousands of times a day through your wiring. And you've got all these smart devices that are always awake, always looking for what communication am I waiting for? So the thing is, today we are in sympathetic stress, nervous system mode, fight or flight, and it's reflected in our personalities, it's reflected in our cellular activity because our cells can never do deep, deep restoration because we have to be in the other autonomic nervous system mode, parasympathetic, in order to get that what kind of work done. Right, right. So, so even if there's not a uh, you know per se direct causal link, um, it, it even even just the fact if it's if it's interfering with your sleep and you aren't able to. I mean, one of the one of the main purposes of sleep, as you mentioned, was you know restoration and healing. Um, if your body's not able to ever you know uh, repair or detoxify or any of those things, because uh, yeah, you're in that kind of fight or flight sort of. Uh, um, that fight or flight uh, kind of, I guess, um, physiology. Um, yeah, I guess, so I guess we could be talking about, uh, you know, another factor, just uh, another in the, the dozen or 13 I've come across, um, you know, that's, uh, that are implicated in, in the cause of chronic disease. Is that, uh, is that the case? You know, it could be a, another root cause, I guess, another, another contributing cause to chronic disease? Yeah, chronic just means that complete healing hasn't happened. The body doesn't know chronic from acute inflammation. Inflammation is inflammation. When you have cells that are injured, wherever they happen to be, and here I'll just segue into one of my favorite concepts, which is mm -hmm. there's only one disease. That's it. We only have one disease, but it gets different names based on where cellular damage or injury shows up. So if cellular injury shows up in your eye, in certain tissues of the eye, it has a certain name. If it's in different tissues of the eye, it has a different name. If it's in your liver or your pancreas, or it's got names wherever the cells happen to be falling apart. So that group of cells undergoing that condition, that is given a disease name, right? But the cause of disease is simply that cells are getting weak, tired, they can't do their basic housekeeping, they certainly can't repair. And so they're starting to uh, die, they're starting to fail. So. The disease state we're in, when it becomes chronic, it just means that our body has tried to repair, tried to repair in this regard in the past, but it hasn't been able to do any complete healing. And so now this area is constantly just limping forward. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's certainly, certainly interesting, certainly interesting. So um, I suppose, <clears throat> Gosh, yeah, it's 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 hard, Sophia, because I, I know with with this this past year of really digging into just just health and nutrition specifically, um, it is it is very very difficult out there, and um, obviously we're not. I mean, just like with you know the with. Uh, uh, um, you know, obesity is not going down. Well, the our, our exposure to electricity is uh, you know not going up. You know, generally speaking, um, you know, I, there are some folks who are moving out to, to rural areas and such, um, and might be able to escape some of the uh, I guess the the prison, um, the, you know, the, the the prison known as cities. But um, I guess uh, um, it's it, it's it's with I guess the, the the I guess yeah with the newest iteration, uh, the newest iterations coming along. Do you do you see the problem uh, of getting worse? 
Well, the millimeter waves and the increased use of dev devices in this uh, environment that's going to be ruled by surveillance capitalism. You know, one thing, if you watch television at all and you see the um, channel for, I think it's HGTV, where they do home remodeling. I've noticed this over the years. I don't watch this channel much, but every single show is all about c gutting the interiors of houses, making open floor plan with mm -hmm. plenty of light. And all, they always want you to have granite countertops and these, you know, highly reflective stainless steel appliances lots of glass, and I'm thinking, this was years ago, I was thinking, what? I, mean, I thought they were energy conserving. Well, why don't they have the small rooms? They want these big rooms, open floor plan, lots of light, and I thought this is all for surveillance. They're gonna have cameras in everything, all your machines, your TVs, and all everything will have a camera, and they don't want walls, because they want you to be seen for this right. data mining of human behavior, and they want these highly reflective surfaces that bring light and you know amplify light, so you can be watched. And the 5G influx is all about no latency. 4G and 3G, the infrastructure across the country, for instance, was copper cables. Even though the last leg of the deployment was wireless, the same is for 5G in that the infrastructure is now, it has no latency because it's fiber optic cables. So you're getting speed of light transmission. There's no lag time between a message being received and interpreted and a message being sent and received somewhere else. So that allows the technocratic state with all of its, let's just call it ivory towers in which they are observing us. They can model through their surveillance of everything we're doing, what we're doing in real time. And so a whole city can be modeled on this, let's just call it like in the cloud in terms of data, um, data being posted and data being taken and received instantaneously. So that's the beauty of the 5G. It travels at the speed of light. There is no latency and they can watch us in real time. And that's all part of what's called uh, biocapitalism human capital market. I'm learning about this from Alison McDowell, whose website is wrenchinthegears.com. But this is all to furnish a new kind of investment product, a spectrum of products, which will be uh, looking at and making money from, profiting from all of our behaviors. So when you talk about our addiction to devices because of how, um, how you know easy they've made our lives and you can stay in touch with your kids every minute of the day all you have to do is look at your phone because each of them has a phone and they're going to text you where they are and you can tell them that you're coming to pick them up in 15 minutes and all of this information dependence mm -hmm. is i think it weakens us as a species because we don't think for ourselves you know we we are we're constantly interrupting each other's lives. So I say we don't live in our current environment. We live through our phone in some secondary world of text and images and messages. And it, you're never living your real life as long as you're holding your phone and looking to see what's coming through the phone. But the presence of the electromagnetic frequencies, um, the radio frequencies especially, is really damaging human systems, human biology. The human body being electrical, the cytoplasm in the cells has to carry a negative charge. And when, when you hit cells with radio frequencies, they act as though they have been told to open up their voltage-gated ports. There are ports, cell membranes are porous, they're electroporous, because they receive voltage, they receive frequencies, and this is the piezoelectric foundation of the body in that the crystalline materials in the body are constantly moderating information. They are allowing frequencies to strike them and they're releasing voltages. Piezoelectric means when you hit a crystal with a frequency, it 
responds by giving off a voltage, and when you hit a crystal with a voltage, it will give off a frequency. So the body mm. is modulating messages through these piezo materials, and you've got piezo crystals in your bones, you've got them in your DNA, you've got them everywhere. I mean, they're crystalline proteins that make up, for instance, viruses are crystalline proteins. They're information transmitting devices, and if they transmit information, it's either uh, electric in nature, or it's a frequency that they give off, and they change something's shape, the shape of something because of that. And all of that is the foundation of your bioelectric uh, metabolism. So when you have all this electricity around you, and it's pounding your cell membranes with forces, because every frequency is felt as a mechanical force in the body, then those voltage-gated channels open up, then tons, as Martin Paul tells us, he specializes in bioelectricity, calcium floods into the cell. Calcium is a cation, meaning it's positive, CA positive. And so then it's looking for negative um, to fit with it, and your cell is negative. So it, this calcium is taking all the negative charge out of your cytoplasm, and your cell has to make more negative charge, and it ends up getting really weary and worn out. And so to me, the, the, the kind of feeling that we have in our life, we're constantly agitated, we're constantly stressed, we're not happy, we're not relaxed, we don't smile, we are rushing from here to there, getting things done, holding a phone in our hands, checking it all the time, trying to juggle 10 or 20 balls in, in one minute. And all of that activity comes from and the unpleasantness of all that activity comes from our neurobiology being changed. We're just being hit with too much electrical impulse. And if you took that all away, we would calm down. We would become wholly different. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, yes, it's kind of the curse of civilization, too, because I know uh, back a, a few years ago when, uh, um, yeah, definitely, definitely still asleep in many, many ways, uh, you know, I was looking forward to the gigabit internet, you know, because I, I was a gamer, you know, I, I was looking forward to the to the fast gaming speeds. That's that's how they sold it to, to me back then. Um, but, uh, yeah, now I live on a 22-acre homestead, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly, uh, you know, retreating, um, <laughs> retreating away from uh, um, from civilization, to, to, to put it mildly. But um, I, I guess, so So if, if, uh, if, if we were move ourselves from the electrical environments if um you know uh, i interviewed a, a dr john apsley uh, who does regenerative lifestyles been making the long lasting i guess the long living cultures uh, throughout the world um but uh um you know having a you know really good quality water um good quality non toxic you know food obviously um do you do you think um this 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 chronic this chronic uh, you know d disease state um is reversible um do you think the body still has uh, uh, do you think do you think uh, these from your research do you think some of these chronic disease states are, are reversible um if uh, we remove ourselves from from these uh, i guess these negative environments well of course i'm not a healthcare practitioner but it, to me, it's a no-brainer that if you stop banging your head against the wall, it will not hurt anymore. You will improve <laughs> your condition. So if you stop exposing yourself to electricity, which Arthur Furstenberg writes toward the end of his book, is like rain on a campfire. It dampens the flames of combustion in living cells. So one of the, the, the things caused by too much electricity is that your cells are deprived of oxygen. They have oxygen deficiency. They have energy deficiency. Let's put it that way. And you know what happens when you are energetically deficient? This is an amazing parallel he has drawn. So this is not my original work, but I'm going to restate it here. Mm -hmm. Think of animals who hibernate, okay? Rattlesnakes go in their dens, cold-blooded animals. Then you've got the bear who hibernates over the winter. There are other hibernating animals. And Furstenberg looked at these animals and he realized that the animals who hibernate, they slow their metabolism down so much that they don't consume a lot of energy, which is how they get through an entire winter without eating. But when you compare hibernating animals to non-hibernating animals, what you learn is that you end up dragging out the length of your life. You lower the, let's call it, quality of your life. 
and you drag out the time. So he theorizes here that what we have going on in our bodies now, this lengthened lifespan that we've got is partially due to the electrification of our lives and that we're going into a kind of hibernation. We are in lower um, metabolic production rate and our lives are therefore stretched out, but we become sicker. So the longer you live, the sicker you are, the weaker you are, the less dynamic the entirety of your functionality is. So electricity has given us the, you could say the, it's like a comparable to turning us into a hibernation state. Gosh, and is that a, is that a, wow, that's another, another very interesting, um, I guess, interesting way to put that because, I mean, it, yeah, it does kind of look like most people are just coasting through life, right? Um, and, and one, yeah, in one way or another, um, I mean, the, 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 um, uh, popular culture, you know, the, the zombie reference comes to mind, but, um, yeah, yes, uh, certainly, certainly, certainly not good. And I'm, I'm there with you. I mean, I, 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 I have to, I have to believe, you know, with, with, you know, humans, be, you know, humans getting to this point, um, these chronic disease states, um, seem to be, um, you know, it's kind of the, the body's defense mechanism, at least for, for some, for some of them. Um, so, um, I, I, I have to, like, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's, I think it's certainly possible to, to, to regenerate the body, at least with, with, with some of these things, especially, um, seeing improvements, uh, by minimizing, uh, yeah, minim minimizing negative impacts. So, um, I guess, uh, let's talk a little bit more about, um, I, I guess, uh, Rick, let's get to some solutions here. Um, could you tell us a bit about, uh, defense from, you know, this, this, um, I guess, uh, ever increasing EMF world? Um, what are some ways that we can, uh, defend ourselves and, uh, I guess, defend our health from it? All right, first of all, you have to practice more abstinence. You don't depend on messages coming across your phone, your computer, your iPad. Let's use our ESP for God's sake. Let's intuit a little more, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. Let's try to navigate through our world with our own instinct, with our biological brain power, not what messages people are sending us on the phone. Let's try to distance ourselves from the devices themselves. Let's not put a Wi-Fi router under our bed. I know somebody who did that and a little while later she developed um, horrible cysts on her ovaries and she is sure that it related to that. Mm. So when she, when she moved the router away from directly under where she slept, she started feeling a lot better. Now that's only one example. It could be an anecdote. It could be worthless. But the fact is, the more you distance yourself from the source of electricity, the more you clean up the dirty electricity in your house. And I have a, a relationship with an electrical engineering company that makes products to do this. And the small products we're used to, the Greenway filters and the Stetzer filters, are not the solution. They only should be applied in certain instances. They are accessory products to a more, let's just say, central or intelligent way of clear, cleaning up the high voltage transients, high frequency transients rather, that are coming across your lines. And I'll explain that. We used to have in our houses, one refrigerator, a couple of electric lights, um, or maybe a few electric lights and a television and that was it and now we have all kinds of we got electric stoves we've got ovens we've got all these different devices in every room we've got you know these entertainment um, TV sets uh, everybody's got stuff plugged in everywhere mm -hmm. we're using power strips everywhere, right um, and what that does is it loads your circuits with more work your circuits when they get a lot of stuff plugged into them that's constantly running, even if it's just seeping, seeping electricity, because it has a little light that has to be kept on to show that it's on, mm -hmm. your circuits are going, ah, you're giving me more work. I don't like it. And they throw out a reaction. The reaction, I'm speaking very simply, it's called the high frequency transients. There's a lot of noise. Electricians call it noise on the line. So you want to clean up that noise because that noise radiates 
in a field out of your outlets and it radiates out of your electric wires that are in your walls. When I was a little girl and I couldn't sleep at night, I was like five years old, six years old, I figured this out. I would get up, take my pillow and all my stuffed animals and put them at the bottom of the bed. And I would put my feet toward the wall and I fell asleep instantly. So when you remove your head, your brain from the wires in your walls and you sleep in the middle of the room, you're gonna sleep a lot better. So you want distance from the electricity. And when electric current is running, it's always producing an electric field, okay? When it's actually being drawn into a something that's using voltage, like a machine or a, or a, a lamp, then it's producing an electromagnetic field. And there are different properties to these fields. Um, but the fact is that neither is good for you. You don't want to live in an environment of high electromagnetic fields, high electromagnetic um, radiation, or radio frequency radiation, which those are the communication devices that we use. They emit radio frequencies. They use the radio, uh, radio wave part of the spectrum. And all of that you probably know, your listeners know, this is considered non-lethal electricity. This is considered non-ionizing uh, frequency. This is con considered safe because it doesn't do much to you in the immediate moment. Ionizing um, radiation like that, that we find from um, uranium, oh, what, what's the word? Uh, uranium depletion, I guess you could call it. Mm -hmm. um, it's very highly active uh, metals that we find in mountains and rocks that give off a ton of energy, alpha particles. They actually give off particles. And um, that type of, those elements, Shane, are not found just anywhere in nature. Biology puts them in mountains, in rocks, where, right. where we can't get to those unless we mine them, right? And man has actually extracted uranium and all of these very highly volatile elements from their rock, um, let's just call them vaults, and started to make weapons and other kinds of technologies out of them. And so now they're in our lives. They affect us, whereas they never used to be. So nature took its most potent, powerful, destructive energy forces and secreted them where biology really didn't go mm -hmm. and now in his thirst to make more technology and more technology and more technology has taken that electromagnetic spectrum of which visible light is a part and we are we are accustomed to visible light because we have to navigate by it and the rest of the spectrum has been empty we are acclimated to the very low end of the electromagnetic spectrum because the Earth has its own electromagnetic field. This is sometimes called the Schumann resonances, and people theorize that that's because lightning is always striking the Earth somewhere, so the Earth's surface has a very mild electrical current in it, a hmm. very mild flow of electrons. And these electrons actually supply you with energy. They are what's called free electron transfer. So this is why when you go to the beach and you see people walking with their bare feet, sloshing in the water, when I see people lying on the sand, invariably there's some part of their body, like a hand or a foot, that's off their towel, dug into the sand. They're clutching a handful of sand. And what they're really doing is grounding. They are receiving free electron transfer, which is being banked in something called ground substance in your body. It is a non-fibrous gel. There's very little in the body that's non-fibrous, okay? Most of the body is made of fibrous tubules. But this is a non-fibrous gel, so my theory is it predates us as eukaryotic complex beings. And the more electrons we get from nature when you garden, why do people love to garden? Because their hands are digging in the soil and they're getting free electron transfer. Right. Why do people love to this? Because in the old days, when the cowboy was on the horse, the horse was trotting over the prairie and the cowboy had his leather boots in the metal stirrups, the bit 
was in the wet horse's mouth. The horse was an electron conductor from the ground, an electron donor to the rider, because everything involved in riding was metal or leather. And so the cowboy all day, even though his feet were off the ground, was getting electron transfer from the horse. Same with walking your dog. When you walked your dog in the past, when you had a leather leash and you were holding it, even if you had rubber shoes on, when your dog is snuffling around in the bushes with his wet nose, he's pulling electron out of the ground and you're getting an electron stream transferred through his leather collar and leather leash into your hand. But now we have nylon leashes and we hire dog walkers. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, it's it's almost uh, it almost seems like everything that we we, we everything is everything human should be doing um uh we aren't, right? Um but uh uh so so I guess uh, you mentioned grounding and I, I heard you mention in uh in, in other interviews. Um there's uh there's actually a grounding pads that pe that um that people can sleep on. Um I guess uh, and you also have a uh, uh you also have a store that you offer some of these things on too. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Some of the the other items people might be able to to utilize to to uh I guess improve their health. Shane, I don't sell grounding um, systems online because I learned that it's a very complex process. You can buy earthing and grounding pads yourself, but I have seen a lot of these. I know the people who designed them and they have a lot of resistance in them for liability purposes. There's a 100,000 ohm resistor in everything you buy commercially that has to do with grounding pretty much, especially made by the earthing company. And that is to protect them from liability in the event of weird things happening. And those grounding, uh, most of that gro those grounding products plug into your wall outlet. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I grounded for years through my wall outlet and found it to be extremely beneficial. But I happen to have a ground in my house which is attached to the copper main, the water main. And that's a uh -huh. very clean and rather unusual ground. Many houses have just a ground rod coming out of their breaker box. And I've heard that that is not as clean and not as good a form of grounding. So I was lucky in that that's how my house is grounded. And I was able to benefit for many years through grounding through the wall outlet but not with the conventional stuff. I was able to come up with a way to do it. Um, a friend had designed something and I modified it and uh, used that. And I was selling that privately. And the thing is though, it's so complicated to explain grounding to people that I think you have to undertake learning about it yourself. I think the best thing to do is to ground outside as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And if you want to ground inside, you must make preferably uh, an outlet that has only the ground part in it and run a line out of your wall to a ground rod under your house. That's the most beneficial way to ground. And the reason you want to ground all night is because you're supplying your body with those free electrons to do its repairs, right? And you're going to be repairing and sleeping very, very soundly. And the dreams, wonderful, wonderful things happen when you're grounding um, all night long. But I'll say this, there are ways to, let's just say, imitate grounding. And they're free, no-brainers, nothing complicated. And one of them is tilting your bed. Have you heard of this? I've, I've heard of the concept. Yeah, yeah, I have, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, where you basically just well, lift, up the, lift up the top of the bed, essentially? Yes. Even though you're not getting free electron transfer, the improvements it makes in your body in general... I would say it's on a par with grounding all night long, sleeping connected to the earth. And you don't have to do anything fancy. So the basic concept is to raise the head end of your bed uh, five to seven inches. And this is easily done with beds that have feet on them. You can actually buy bed risers online and you can stack them accordingly. I went to the garage and got a bunch of books I wasn't doing anything with and I made two stacks of books that were five and a half six inches each and I put them under the feet of my bed at the head end what you don't want to do is uh, jack up your mattress 
and have your legs flat and just your back raised and your head. That isn't the same thing. So that, when okay, you that was a are, picture I had in my head. Yeah, I was thinking of one of those, one of those, not obviously not what you're talking about here. I was thinking about one of those, uh, you know, elevated, um, I guess one of the remote beds they have. So you're, so don't do that then. Okay. No, because the idea here is when you sleep on a slope and you can go to a website called, um, hmm, gosh, it is, uh, his name is, and uh, his name is uh, escaping me too. I'm having a horrible blank here. But inclinedbedtherapy.com, and it was an, an engineer, a British engineer, who went, this is many years ago, I'd say over 10 years ago, to, he went to Egypt, and he was looking at the tombs of the pharaohs, and he saw that all their beds were tilted. They were literally at a five-degree slant, and he wondered what the pharaohs knew that we don't know. So he came back and did a lot of research on uh, human uh, anatomy and the hydraulics of blood circulation and he determined that it is greatly beneficial to be sleeping on a slant like this and the beach is slanted when people lie on the beach you're on a slight slope most of the time because of the way the waves wash and they deposit sand deposit sand and pull back pull back so they're creating a slope but what it does to you in terms of musculoskeletal benefit is that you are experiencing a kind of gentle traction all night when you're lying on a five degree slant and that translates to five to seven inches no less than five no more than seven and when you lie on a slant like that your your musculoskeletal system you are getting alignment natural alignment from the downward force some call that gravity right so your old injuries start to heal and New injuries will recover a lot faster if you lie, if you sleep on a slant than you than if you sleep flat. Now, the other thing that happens is if you picture where your kidneys are, they are right under your um, our heart. They are attached to the descending aorta, the renal arteries, and they receive 25 percent of your freshly pumped blood. And I shouldn't say the word pump because the heart is not a pump, but I catch myself now and then. <laughs> but anyway, so when you're lying flat, all this blood pools in your midsection and your kidneys become overworked. So one thing that a lot of people have reported is when they lie on a slant like that, they don't get up during the night to go to the bathroom because the blood is flowing, flowing, flowing. It's not pooling in the midsection. The kidneys aren't overworked. Um, so what happens is not only does the blood flow to your toes, it makes, you will wake up loose, limber, you feel like you want to run a marathon the minute you jump out of bed. This is how I felt the first time I did it. Stiffness goes away, but in general, the fact that that blood flow is going so evenly down to your feet while you're sleeping, not only does it keep you warmer at night, but it comes back. There's an effect upon the venous return as well, that much more, let's just say, energetic. So your entire circulatory system is working better, which means that everything in your body is is improving in terms of its function, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's that's incredible. That's incredible. Just that that one. I mean, yeah, I'll I'll do that. Uh, I'll do that. So when we when we uh, wrap up here, uh, that's a very very easy uh, easy thing to try out. Um, all about uh, all about those sorts of things. And uh, I guess one one other area um, I've been uh, I've, I've come across uh, in this this area of health and it has to do with electricity. And we're kind of already we're kind of already in this area. But um, there's some I guess some electrotherapy sort of stuff. Uh, do you know anything about uh, about kind of those devices? And and uh, could you speak to that a little bit? If you do. I do not use electrotherapy devices. I have tried them out. Friends have lent them to me, so I'm not an expert on them, but I know that they're popular um, among people, you know, in times of injury, if you use like a TENS unit. I think it's Jerry Tennant who has invented some of this stuff, uh, but there are other people. And I, there are also, you know, mats that you can lie on that pulse electromagnetic energy into you all night long like the I think it's called the MRS or the QRS or something they're quite expensive thousands of dollars but you can also rent them to try them out so any and all of this is it's something you can try but I always prefer to go with what's most natural and what's free to begin with and see if mm -hmm. you can improve that um, I will say that the tilted bed 
is visually disturbing at first, but then you get used to it because you look behind you and you look at this tilt on your bed. It feels like you're on the Titanic or something. You know. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, all right. Uh, uh, very good. Very good. Uh, so I guess, um, yeah, I guess I don't have too much more uh, in the realm of uh, in the in the realm of uh, I guess electricity or EMFs. Um, I suppose one one question that I'll ask you since since I have you here and you might have already answered a little bit of it, but um, I will be uh, tearing down this old farmhouse here in uh, the next year or two, and uh, since I'll be you know putting it back together my myself, and I'll have you know hundred uh, percent you know possibility to customize and, and, and do things. Um, if you were, I guess, uh, um, if you were, I guess, going, I guess, from, from the ground up in terms of protecting yourself from, um, I guess, uh, is there a certain way that you would do it um, from, from your research? Uh, I, I guess, any, any, any thoughts there? You know, I'm not a builder, but I would be fascinated by something like earth ships. Have you ever heard of those? Yes, yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I had the chance to erect something from the ground up, I would make it something like that. Um, but again, I don't have that luxury at this time. And I'm just fascinated by different ways of building. You know, there's lots of things you can explore. I'm sure you've looked into it already since you're about to take all this down, right? Yeah, um, yeah, def definitely familiar with uh, with the Earthships idea. And um yeah, I, I don't know. I'm I'm thinking um, the uh, so the, the this podcast called the Vani podcast and the, the main proponent back in the '60s. Uh, he lived in a uh, he he uh, was a, he was he, he pursued a, a wilderness lifestyle and uh, spent a lot of time camping and then eventually uh, preferred uh, semi underground structures. So I wonder. Um, I, I guess just just a random thought that came to mind. I wonder. Um, obviously, since we you know, we talked about grounding, um, I imagine there there could there could be some potential um, some additional potential health benefits. Like if you construct the earth the earth ship or the earth, that 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 uh, that home like partially underground, and I I don't know like maybe leave the floors dirt. Um, I'm I'm not sure if that just kind of just thinking out loud here. Well, Shane, you would want um, materials that are conductive. You know, ceramic tile is conductive, and you would not want a basement. You would want um, the conductive flooring. If you live on sealed flooring in elevated houses, you, there's actually a voltage differential. It's called body potential and electric potential. And I don't really understand it very well. It's a very hard concept for me to grasp, not being an electrical engineer. But a six foot man, the voltage differential from his feet to his head is 400 volts. So every six feet, you are going up 400 volts in p electrical potential. And Furstenberg says that, you know, our feet are negative, our head is positive. So the farther you get from the Earth's negative charge, which is obviously at your feet, the more positive potential you're creating. And when you are sleeping, for instance, on the second floor, the third floor, they've done studies and found that in old people, their risk of stroke was like 40% higher when they slept on the second floor. So it's always wow. better to be close to the earth. And I would do a floor that was conductive, but when you're in you know, a place like you are in the Midwest, I believe, mm -hmm. you don't want freezing tile under your feet because it is. I mean, tile is bone cold in the winter. So what I also learned, I put this video on my blog um, there was a guy who's a retired post worker in Nebraska, and he created the most marvelous greenhouse in Nebraska that grew citrus and all kinds of fruits and vegetables all year long. And the way he did this was he ported air from underground because the temperature of the earth is pretty constant. Here in San Diego, where I live, it's 58 degrees. Um, if you dig like a big deep hole in the summer or the winter, it's going to be 58 degrees down there because that's the temperature held by the earth itself. When you go to a place like Nebraska or Midwest, it's going to be a little colder. I think it's like 55 degrees. It's not much colder. So if you make these big vents like he did, these tubular vertical vents, and you force air, you fa use fans, and you pump air that is conditioned to a certain temperature from underground. When you have you know, 20 degrees in the winter or 10 degrees or below zero, and your 
blowing 55 degree air upward, then you only have to top off that temperature with a little uh, other form of heat, like electrical or gas or whatever, right? So you're right. starting at a baseline of 55 rather than zero. And the same for the summer. When you live in a place that gets hellishly hot in the summer, over 100 degrees, if you're blowing air up from underground that's 55 degrees, well then you are greatly cooling off the 100 degrees, right? right. So if you really want to do something, creative that's what i would look into yeah that's uh that's that's a great idea i've uh, um you yeah, know with the family member i he and i constructed uh one of those uh um, one of those in an old uh, storage container um kind of a geothermal sort of thing so yeah i'm, I'm familiar with what you're talking about and that's a that's a really really good idea um obviously i was gonna i was leaning t more towards smaller um smaller is uh you know more more efficient and all that but uh anyway yeah i appreciate uh, appreciate uh, those uh, appreciate those insights um, now, I, I guess I don't really have any anything else on uh, um, anything else on electricity or EMF. Um, are there any uh, any other closing thoughts on, on that or advice you'd give to, to the listeners uh, in, in that regard? Maybe 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 it might be worth reemphasizing or I guess emphasizing that it is something they need to be worried about because before I came across uh, your work and, and really started digging into to those podcasts, I mean, I, I really wasn't familiar with this much, um, and I have been using airplane mode a lot more. Uh, a lot more now. So I guess uh, um, closing thoughts on, on uh, the EMF section. Yeah, I have cell phone cases that I make at my online store, avatarproducts.com. You, you're wise to put your phone in airplane mode. You can always check messages because the phone will get messages. But in these cases, you can actually carry your phone turned full on in, in the case against your body because there's a silver material that shields it. And so when you have the silver lining between you and the phone, the phone doesn't penetrate, the signal doesn't penetrate into your body. And I had a farmer's market booth for many years and I heard from people that, you know, they had all kinds of horrible things happen to them from carrying phones. People who carried phones on the right side in those holsters for many years, they had to have a hip replacement. A joint you know replaced on that side so you, that's where degeneration comes in and seriously your bones contain a lot of silica that's a crystal form um, and they conduct those frequencies they will receive them actively from your phone uh, unfortunately you know the bones are a better barrier to this frequency than flesh is so to some extent um, carrying your your skull protects your brain a little bit but you don't people never put their phone against their skull they put it near their temple which is all soft tissue right yeah yeah and there's also something Shane called microwave auditory effect that unfortunately has occurred in several friends that I have who never expected this and when you become sensitive to microwaves in the sense that your brain is now trying to interpret them as sound because that's what happens the cilia in your ears all that piezoelectric conduction is called auditory transduction of sound in your ears when you get microwaves in some people there will become a point where the ear is going i don't know what this is but it seems to me like it's sound of some kind and i have to learn to um, interpret it so in these people they will hear constant screeches and screaming wow. and mm. we, yeah, tinnitus, you know, tinnitus is uh, ringing in the ear. And I have to tell you that when it's very quiet around me, like at night and I don't have a fan on or something, I do hear a very high pitched hum. And a lot of people I know hear that. And I believe that that's a mild form of microwave auditory effect, that we're actually our brains are trying to interpret these signals and assign sound to them. But when it becomes highly painful and interruptive, I mean, I have a friend who tells me that it makes her sick to her stomach. It's like an emergency siren going off and it won't stop. You can't live like that. Yeah, yeah, I... I <clears throat> 
yeah, thankfully, thankfully, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not that sensitive. But I'm not that sensitive to it. Um, but I, I have heard from people who, you know, they, they go, they go into a city or downtown, and um, yeah, they, uh, they don't feel good. Um, like they, they can, they can certainly feel, um, certainly uh, feel the effects. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 just, it's uh, another one. I mean, uh, in this. <sighs> Gosh, uh, um, and this this minefield of a world when it comes to, to health and nutrition, um, with uh, with yeah you know, all the toxins um, as we talked about um, in this discussion, uh, um, the EMFs, um, the uh, the vaccines, just big pharma in general, that uh, entire evil institution. Um, there's uh, there's certainly a lot to, to defend from, um, and I'm certainly thankful that you came on and uh, shared some insight on uh, on on the EMF issue because uh, yeah I'm not I'm sure some of my, my audience wasn't familiar with that, but uh, um, we are at about uh, at about an hour here, and I do want to uh, to, to respect your time um i guess uh um would you uh um want to uh um plug your your websites uh, anything else you want to leave for the listeners and then uh, at some point in the near future I'd, I'd um love to get you back on and chat again yes shane i would love to do a show with you about glyphosate another show about some things i've learned about you know this covid shutdown um i will read just one paragraph from my newsletter on electricity sure please because i think it's really powerful and it's the work of uh, Arthur Furstenberg from the book Invisible Rainbow. But what he explains is that when the engine of your lives is the electron transport system in the mitochondria of your cells and electricity negatively affects that, he calls it poisoning the electron transport chain. You slow down your rate of living. That's the hibernation parallel I drew earlier. And ironically, when maximum metabolism slows, because your biology is using less and less energy over time, the result is longer life. So we need to keep this in mind. We're, we got people living till 95, 100 these days. It's not that unusual, right? But what it boils down to is that your life is dragged out, but its quality is worse. So this is the perfect model for big pharma. You live longer, but you will become and remain sick, right? Mm. So they love this. Yeah. So I just want people to yeah. understand that long lives doesn't mean quality of life. And how many old people do we know who are on like 10 medications, 20 medications, and all they do is take pills? And they even have apps now. For old people on their phones, can you imagine that? Remind them when to take which pill. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, certainly uh, you know, as I as I look at things, uh, society and civilization wide, it's cer certainly a very very not not a good outlook at all, not a good outlook at all. Um, but I have to uh, you know, recall back to Dr. John Apsley, you know, um, you know, there are those of us who uh, um, who are you know taking the initiative ourselves and improving our health and uh, increasing our freedom. Um, in this increasing total increasingly totalitarian world, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I think uh, there's there's, cer there's certainly uh, there's certainly ways to, to improve health on an indiv individual basis, uh, even though things look quite bleak um, at the uh, at the civilization level, and uh, it's not uh, not going to uh, get any better soon. So, um, Sophia, thank you so much. Uh, your website, sophiasmallstorm.com, and uh, avatarcourse.com is uh, your store. Uh, is that correct? No, avatarproducts.com, oh, avatar and there are there there's a, a product that really affects your uh, ancient electrical language between your cells and the uh, and the gut biome uh, called restore I've done very well with that uh, people are very loyal they bought a lot of it and they it's something that becomes a habit taking restore and I can explain that on another show so yeah thank you very much and I would say to people don't despair you, your freedom is in your liberating yourself from dependence on too many modern conveniences it's that simple yep indeed indeed uh we, we talked uh, i mean the, the theme of this podcast uh since we've launched has been self-sufficient it's been self-sufficiency and it's been uh yeah certainly increasing uh this year so um yep yeah, right there with you yeah 100 percent agree um so thank you thank you sophia so much for coming on um yeah i'll definitely have to get you back on uh, in the near future talk uh, glyphosate and and uh, there's all sorts of uh, I, I know with with me um uh, there's uh, there's there's no uh, i guess limit to the topics that i research and uh, um i'm sure uh, uh, I'm, I've, I've seen uh, some of some of the topics of yours too and it all kind of uh, it all seems to kind of merge together at least uh, in, in some degree um the interesting research paths but uh, sophia thank you so much for coming on and uh i will uh, let you go um this time and uh, yeah we'll, we'll we'll talk later thank you right. thank you sophia